In a watershed, when rainfall lands on the surface, most of that water doesn't land directly on the stream. Most of that water lands on the surrounding landscape and the hill slopes. And from there, eventually reaches a stream and exits the catchment. Those processes are truly core to understanding catchment hydrology. And therefore, we're going to talk today about flow, rivers, and the hydrograph. So the hydrograph is a plot, basically. It's a measure of water discharge through time. And what we want to know is what sets the relationship between the hydrograph and what we call the hydrograph or the time series of precipitation on the surface. And from that, we're also just going to ask the broader question of what sets river discharge. In the plot at the bottom, what you can see are there, there are several different terms that there. There's R, which is meant to be rainfall, ET, which is evapotranspiration. And so just you know remember that from these earlier lectures if you've seen them. Uh, here there's also a well, and so we don't often think about this in undisturbed systems, but in many um, human altered watersheds, there might be water extractions from wells. There might also be water inputs um, coming from reinjection of fluids. And it could be that even if there's pumping from a well, it flows through a farmer's field, some evaporates and then it re-enters the river. And there are also um, additions, so that all these Gs at the bottom, so those are different additions and subtractions of groundwater to and from the stream and into and out of the aquifer, so the zone of saturated subsurface that lies beneath it. And then, of course, there's a stream, and that's exiting the catchment. And so what we're going to do is imagine that, that at the bottom of this catchment, we have a stream gauge. And a stream gauge is a device that measures river discharge, and almost all stream gauges do this by measuring the water level. And then by using a combination of empiricism and understanding about flow mechanics to convert that water level into a um, river discharge in units of volume per time. So you can think meters cubed per second, or in the US we often use cubic feet per second. Um, I generally keep everything in SI, but I just want you to know that because almost every government agency here will have it in feet. And so you'll just be able to, over time, convert those two in your head. So um, thanks to Scott Alexander for this slide. So this is a cartoon of the hydrograph and the hydrograph of a, from a particular flood. And so what we see here is that there is this hydrograph, the rainfall, which is... Um, hanging out in the upper left, and that is positive downwards in this graph. And then the hydrograph is this curve that rises and peaks out and then falls down to the right. And what we can see is that as the rainfall starts, the hydrograph starts to pick up, and it doesn't pick up immediately with the first rainfall, it lags it a little bit. Then after the rainfall peak intensity, at some point, that water has moved through the watershed, whether through overland flow or interflow or possibly through the groundwater, but not likely for this sort of storm hydrograph. Um, and then that later on de decreases approximately exponentially through time. And that uh, de eventually decreases back down towards zero. And so this is a watershed in Northwest Houston and it's um, an outflow, as the plot says, re resulting from 3.3 inches of rain, um, which is a fairly significant rain event. You can see that that's over the course of less than a day in a three and a half square mile watershed. Three and a half square miles is not very large. Um, so you can think about that and take the square root of that, right? And so it's about a mile by a mile. So let's say about 1,500 meters by 1,500 meters. So this is a small area. And the fact that starting at zero and ending at zero is telling us that there isn't any groundwater input that's sufficient to um, go beyond the surface. So from this, we know that the overland flow that occurs here is probably going to be um, infiltration excess overland flow. And we also know that we would expect that there to be a fairly low, a fairly short lag time between the rainfall and the runoff because there just isn't that much space, right? It's the, the water doesn't have very far to travel and so it won't take very long for it to reach the rivers. And here's also from Scott a nice little graph showing a couple of the important names. 
And so the, what we call the time when the water is rising is the rising limb of the hydrograph. The peak is the crest. And that's what you might hear on the news, right? So that you can hear, you know, the Minnesota River at Mankato crested on Saturday at so and such and such feet. It was within, you know, so, so far from the top of the levees. There was some erosion and people are sandbagging downtown, you know, something like that. And then on the right hand side, there's the falling limb. And eventually that turns into this recession. And the recession is this kind of sometimes longer period of falling that goes beyond that exponential function I was showing you. Um, and then eventually we hit back, hit back to base flow, which is just fed by groundwater. This is an example of a model simulation output. And in this example, we actually have no base flow. We just have water supplied by the storm and only the storm. And so the plots at the bottom show the depth of flow with time after the beginning of precipitation. And so we can see at one hour, immediately when the storm shuts off, we have water flowing across all the streams across, through the landscape. After two hours, the water is really concentrated in the main stem. After three hours, there's some in the main stem, but much of it has left the landscape. And after eight hours, almost everything has exited the landscape. And so this is another example of a relatively small catchment. And this would be characteristic of a dry environment with no base flow. If your gauge is really close to one of these flood peaks, you would, would expect that there would be rainfall and then you'd almost immediately see a discharge response. If your gauge is much farther downstream from that flood peak, you'll have to wait a lot longer to get the peak discharge response. And that peak discharge will also be smeared out over a longer period of time because it takes a bunch of different travel times for water to reach the river. So you can imagine that, you know, you'll start out by getting some of the local water and then you'll get some of the water that has flowed, you know, via parts of the catchment that are nearer to you and maybe eventually reach the peak when you get all of the overland flow and some of the shallow interflow in. But some of that interflow and overland flow from high up in the catchment might not reach your location until later, especially if the water is in interflow or might be um, joining with the groundwater. And so depending on you know, how far up the catchment water is coming from and how quickly it's going, it might then take a lot longer for all of that water to reach you, and so therefore the hydrograph is going to be smeared out over time. So just to give you an example, here's a, um, a quick image of a sandbed river that I took. So I was um, camping overnight in Nebraska while driving to a conference and to see some friends in Boulder, Colorado. And this is during the fairly wet spring of 2019. So this flood is not, um, this, this flow is not like, you know, a gigantic flood, but it's definitely like high. And so what we can see here is in this Alcorn River, so this is a sandbed river. I'm going to label a few features for you. So of course the zone where the water is moving is the channel. There's a bar which you can see in the back. And so that's a sandbar just um, sitting out there. I could walk out on it if I wanted to. I walked onto a different sandbar. Maybe I walked into that one too. It was a, over a year ago now. Um, the floodplain is on the right hand side and something if you're really careful and looking you can actually see alternating light and dark layers in the banks that have been eroded and exposed and those show different zones of soil formation where it's darker and organic material deposition and then the lighter layers in the banks show times at which the river rose to above its bankful stage which is indicated in white here and deposited some significant amount of sand. And so each of these sandy layers is, is an ancient flood layer. And in fact, we can go through and study them to know something about the flood history of this river and the processes that form the floodplain. We call a river a river stage, so a river's elevation, um, surface elevation, at, to be bankful when it reaches the same elevation as the floodplains. And the sandy banks that I mentioned earlier with all of these flood deposits have a high hydraulic conductivity, right? We talked about that in an earlier lecture if you saw it, but if you missed it, um, because these sands are much coarser than something like a clay or a silt and because they're not 
stuck together with hydrostatic or electrostatic forces like a silt, um, or sorry, like a clay. Uh, I'll let me clarify, clays have partial positive and negative charges on their platy mineral surfaces, and so they tend to stick together. That's why clays are so sticky um, when you're trying to do anything with them. Um, run, run in them, make mud pies. Um, so the sandy banks here allow water to move through quickly, and so you can expect that interflow is going to be able to enter this river relatively easily, and that there's going to be a strong connection with the groundwater table. So there's going to be um, a pretty tight connection of groundwater and base flow in this river. And the bankful stage is important for a couple reasons that I'm going to bring up just now, but revisit later. So the first one is because this is the level at which the water starts going out onto the floodplain. And so this is when it becomes a hazard, a, flo a major flooding hazard. The second reason is because bankful discharge is reached in you know, temperate river systems about once every um, one to two years. So this is a frequent flood that happens. And in fact, it's so consistent that geomorphologists studying this have learned that rivers actually will self-adjust such that their channels are just about the right size to um, hold the one to two year flood. And so this bankful stage is actually part of the coevolution of river channels and climate determining river discharge. And for those of you who might be interested in this, um, hydrological modeling is a whole field into itself. And so this is a figure from a paper that Crystal Ng and I wrote with several co-authors. Um, and this is actually one example of where I was working on the geomorphology side, characterizing the landscape and the shape of the catchments. And she was working to build inputs to the hydrological model, which is the USGS model, GS flow, which combines mod flow, a groundwater flow module with PRMS, a parameterized um, surface water flow model. And so you can see in the upper left, so this is the Shulkas River in Peru. Um, in the upper left, we divide it into small watersheds, and you can see all of those blue lines moving through it. Those are the main channels in each of those sub-watersheds. In panel B, the upper middle, we're showing stream flow in cubic meters per second, and the scale on the right is a log scale. And so we have width increasing as well as color becoming redder as discharge is increasing. And so these are in units of cubic meters per second. And so we have something like five cubic meters per second near the exit of the watershed. And in the headwaters, we have closer to 0.1 cubic meters per second. And so as the watershed area is getting bigger, we're also seeing more, more discharge. In this uh, panel C, we're showing water table depth. And I've been talking about base flow, right? So groundwater and surface water are really closely connected. And in this class, we're talking mostly about surface water because that's what moves sediment and that's what causes landscapes to evolve. But groundwater is critical to understanding surface water by creating conditions in which surface water can start to flow above the landscape by adding base flow, and in fact, by affecting hill slope processes. So you can think back to our discussions about pore fluid pressure and hill slope stability. And groundwater also affects the ecology and vegetation, which impact the geomorphology. So in panel C, we have groundwater levels, and you can see that there are, there are groundwater levels that are closer to the surface. So the more blue colors, um, more light blue colors along the river channel network, and then away from the river channels, it becomes more purple. So this is deep groundwater, um, which is far below the surface beneath these high peaks in the Andes where this uh, study is, or this example is. And so panel D then has our combination of precipitation, so our hydrograph, and stream flow, so our hydrograph. And you can see that it's actually not all that simple. And in fact, it looks like it takes some time for there to be enough water in the landscape to essentially charge up the aquifers and the shallow so soil storage in the interflow zone before there's finally enough to really cause some of these large flood peaks that probably occur from significant interflow and or overland flow moving water across the landscape. So if you're interested in this particular system, Lauren Summers is uh, now a postdoc at MIT, and she's the one who was studying this catchment, um, and she co-authored this paper with us, and thanks to Lauren for the data. And, and if you're interested in this in general, you can look up hydrological models such as GSflow, or PIHM, um, or many others on the internet, and 
Um, and I also encourage you to think about classes in hydrology or hydrological modeling taught in our department as well as in civil, environmental, and geoengineering. So from this, our next steps are to think about once the water is in the river, how do we measure that discharge and how do we characterize that discharge? And that is going to be for next time.